You guys having a good time tonight? Any first timers here? Raise your hand so I know who not to talk to. All right, first timer, one, two, three, four. Welcome. Nice to have you all here. My name's Billy. Bill for short, Bill for long, nothing more, nothing less. We're going to go over some executor things, and that has to do with estates. Um, and it's, uh, if you guys don't understand that yet, um, we can get into it a little bit after the meeting, just a little bit so you understand. So I don't want to lose you. But uh, a few years ago, approximately on your birth date, there was a death. Your birth certificate is the proof of that death. Anything spelled in all capital letters name, if you look up definitions into the U.S. Code, it says that it is a deceased or a vessel. It can be a, any of those things, or a corporation. The word corporation, we know, comes from the word corpse, which means a dead thing. So as we learn these terminologies and what they really mean and how they apply to our lives, it's really great to understand the word executor. Now, I like to call it an executor because they execute things. They execute plans. They execute problems. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go on a little bit about this and read it to you so you understand. And if you are a secured party creditor or a principal... This is really good information so that you understand how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. It says, it's both an honor and a burden to serve as someone's executor, as an executor is entrusted with responsibility for winding up someone's earthly affairs, a big or little task depending on the situation. Essentially, an executor is charged with protecting a deceased person's property until all debts and taxes have been paid and seeing that what's left is transferred to the people who are entitled to it. The law does not require an executor, also called a personal representative, to be a legal or financial expert, but it does require the highest degree of honesty, impartiality, and diligence. This is called the fiduciary duty. The duty to act with scrupulous good faith and honesty on behalf of someone else. Executors have a number of duties depending on the complexity of the deceased person's financial and family circumstances. Typically, an executor must, and I'm just going to go over the um, all bold things here, find the deceased person's assets and manage them until they are distributed to inheritors. Decide whether or not probate court proceedings are needed. Figure out who inherits property. File the will in the local probate court. Handle day-to-day -day details. Set up an estate bank account. Use the state funds to pay continuing expenses, pay debts, pay taxes, and supervise the distribution of the deceased person's property. That sounds very boring, doesn't it? I mean, it's just kind of a bummer. But what if, for entertainment purposes only, we were talking about your legal entity? Your name, in all capital letters, is an entity. Some refer to a trust. So if that legal entity died at birth and you've been walking along not understanding that there is a large fortune there for you to take care of all the issues that we just talked about, wouldn't that be great if you were the executor? Yeah. Okay, so let's say we read this again with that in, in context. I find out that the heir to all of this wealth, because I was born in America, has been given to a trustee that may fall under a heading of U.S., and they have been acting as the executor because I'm not old enough to understand all that. Let's say... I'm a juvenile delinquent like they call me in Title 18 because I haven't stepped up to the plate and said, hey, I'm the executor and I'm going to do some things here to show that. Let's say I revoke power of attorney and I appoint myself as the settler. that sound good? And now I'm going to settle all the things that are required and I'm going to do them with honesty, impartiality, and diligence. 
So the first thing I want to do is I want to notify the Social Security Administration that the guy that they're representing died. And now I need to notify maybe some alphabet companies, corporations that are saying that there's some debt owed to, maybe taxes. So I would open up an account so that I could affect payment to all those entities. Does that make sense? This is exciting stuff because the accounts are real and the players are all real and the actors are real in their real matrix. So now if we pay off all the taxes in, let's say, a, an executor situation where there was a trust and the person died, that would be the testator. Okay, so the testator is gone and, and we need to settle up because as soon as we get all the taxes paid, and we get all the debt paid, now there's some extra things that we need to do. We need to find out who the beneficiaries are. I like that. Because I would like to be the beneficiary. And as the executor, we get to appoint that. Now, if we figure out that the dead, the dead guy, the testator, has some property, we'll be able to claim that too. Now, has anybody ever heard of a property list attachment A? Raise your hand. Oh, there's a lot of us out here. So we already know what the property is. Giggle, giggle. Um, we also need to notify the probate court. Now, that's going to be real easy because all the courts in this government, corporate venue, are probate courts. Every one of them. Now, that's really good news because we don't have to go looking for one. They're all there. Now, you might get a notice every once in a while. It's an offer to pay some taxes at, say, a traffic place or a magistrate place. All those things are already in place for us to go present that we are the executor for the trust and we want to settle up. Now, there's ten rules of commerce. I've, uh, I've talked about this a bunch. You can buy it online if you pull up the uh, Google and search for it, Ten Rules of Commerce. There are a few copies floating around in this building I know of if you want to borrow it and watch it. But the first rule of commerce is that you cannot control that which you did not create. Second rule is you can only control that which you create. The third rule, this is really cool. Are you liking this, man? This is really good stuff. It's just, it's so simple. And they give us manuals called executor manuals so that you can understand how to handle your estate. The third rule is <clears throat> that you cannot interfere with commerce. And I'm getting real close to it right now. So I'm going to be real careful that I don't interfere with commerce with anyone in here that may be a U.S. citizen. Because if you want to be a U.S. citizen... We're all for that. That's great. There's a whole bunch of us in here that are not U.S. citizens. I don't want to get too far out of the line there. But an MSO is a title. Everybody here gave up title to something along the way. If you have a driver's license, you gave up title to travel. If you have a license plate on the back of your car, you turned it into a vehicle when you did that. And you gave up title. And by giving up title, you give up the rights and the profits from that for a benefit and privilege. So the thing that scares a lot of people is they, they get really depressed about all this and say, well, I gave up everything. How do I get it back? So I did another word study. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about regaining title. Okay. Uh, let, yeah, let's, let's, let's show you what a title really looks like. This is, says a certificate of live birth. That was printed up at the hospital, and they send it off. It's a little card, and they make it smaller so that it fits really nice on top of um, a securities instrument. A securities instrument, you can tell, is a securities instrument because it has this really nice border around the outside edge. At the very bottom of this one, does it have a bond company? At the bottom of my birth certificate, they hit it in the scroll, that really nice border that has all the fancy penmanship, all that stuff. Mine is hid in there. In fact, I got one from the county, and I got one from the state, and they bonded it through two different securities companies. 
corporations. One of them was American Bond and Note Company, and the other one was a Midwest Bank and Note Company. So just for fun, I looked at an old one, and it says Pacific Bond Company. So um, there's a guy named D, and his, I think his middle initial is T, and his last name is CeCe. So that's the guy that's got your stuff. Yeah, DTCC. And you can do that all with uh, capital letters and Google it, and you can see where DTCC lives. It's an international entity. It's pretty neat when you guys want to really get into this and, and understand who you are and what they've done for us. Now, i got to tell you, they've done a great job in some aspects of providing um, some serious funding and benefits because of this certificate. Can you see? Uh, that's a routing number. Um, that's one of the presidents right there that set up all this corporate stuff. Do you guys know that in, in 1760, they had way more knowledge, the average family had way more knowledge about corporate law, contract law, and trust law than even some of the best paid attorneys today have. When they came to America, they came here for freedom, and they came here to retain titles. They didn't want anybody telling them that they couldn't speed on their horse because they had the title to their horse. They had a brand on it. They didn't want to be told <clears throat> that they couldn't plant crops in their yard or have a certain color paint on their house. <clears throat> they came here for freedom. But they came here for respect for each other. So if old George Washington wanted to paint his barn yellow, I'd let him. And I would, I would uphold his right to have a yellow barn instead of complain about it and go to the, what are those uh, HOAs, Homeowners Association? and complain about it and try and get his yellow paint removed. There's a big responsibility to have that kind of authority, and there's also a big responsibility to uphold someone else's authority. So I'm, I'm just touched on that for a minute. Titles. Now, the executor, I looked up some words to go with executor. Uh, this is what the noun says. You got it? It says, the person appointed to administer the estate of a person. Does anybody know what person means? Say it. Corporation. Corporation. Who has died leaving a will. And that's mean, that, will, that means like my will. My will to be here tonight, I was here. His will is to eat shrimp. So he has a will. That's what we mean by when we say will. Which nominates. I like the word nominate. I nominate me to be wealthy. Second it. <laughs> My wife gave me a second. All opposed. Nobody opposed. The eyes have it. Unless there is a valid objection, the judge will appoint the person named in the will to be the executor. Now, here's what's crazy. If nobody appoints an executor to an estate, the state appoints one for you. Now, a lot of times that could be, say, an attorney. It could be a prosecuting attorney. It could be the judge. It could actually be the clerk of the court. It may be an administrator for an alphabet company. It's kind of like hide the P under the shell game. When you get there, you go, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? Hey, I, I'm a sovereign. I have rights. I have this. I have that. Really? Where's your executor? What's that? I'll point him. Okay, you're going to jail. Great. <laughs> that quick. Bang. You're in. <laughs> okay, and they administer your will while you're in there. Now, that's really great. Because they're digging into your account. Is this cool? Mm-hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go on a little farther. The executor must ensure that the person's desires expressed in the will are carried out. Practical responsibilities including gathering up and protecting the assets of the estate. Have you done all you can do to gather up the assets of your estate? I have. I got it all piled up and I got a UCC-1 on it. That's really good news for anybody that doesn't have that done, because if I can tell you I did it, you can do it. 
If little old Bill right here can figure this stuff out, little old you can do too. It's really great. Okay, so now that we got uh, protecting the assets of the estate, we need to obtain information in regarding to all beneficiaries named in the will and any other potential heirs, collecting and arranging for payments of debts of the estate, approving or disapproving creditors' claims. And i got to tell you this, I'm going to approve them all. I don't have any problem. I don't want any controversy. I'm going to settle it up the minute they give it to me. I want to accept all claims. Okay? Okay. Making sure estate taxes are calculated, forms filed, and tax payments made, and in all ways assist the attorney for the estate, which the executor can select. I pick me because I, I don't want an attorney at law. I want an attorney in law. See, when you're at the river, you're not really wet. When you're in the river, you're all in. Okay? So we don't want to practice at law. We want to be in law because that's where it's at. When you get in the pool, I'm going to tell you right now, all the rest of the guys at law don't want to get in the pool with you. <laughs> and if you're the only guy in the pool, there's only one story being told. You guys following me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So as we go on, um, there's some things, words, like um, I'm, I'm getting into this word called advocate. And the word advocate means to speak or write in favor of, support or urge by argument, recommend publicly, and then it gives a sentence, he advocated higher salaries for the teachers. The, the noun word of advocate is a person who speaks or writes in support or defense of a, what's person? Corporation. 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 Cause, etc. Usually followed by an advocate of peace. A person who pleads for or in behalf of another. Or a person who pleads the cause of another in a court of law. Okay? That's an advocate. Now, advocate has the word vocate in it, right? So, if we understand revocate, that's the revenue of something. Now, if you hear the word internal revenue service, if we tear down the word internal revenue service, the word revenue stands out like it doesn't even stand out. Revenue. We think it's money. It means the re-venue. If you're a musician, you know what a venue is. That's where you're playing. It's a, it's a specific thing. To re-venue means you move it to somewhere else. So the internal Revenue service is taking your money and putting it into another venue. So the word advocate comes also from a word vocate, which means to speak in on behalf of. So if we're going to revocate, comes another word off of that is revocation. So the word revocation means to to recall or to call back. To the act of instance of revoking. Now, how can you revoke something? We can't, as citizens, because we gave up the right to revoke. Right? Only the king can revoke something, because he had it in first position. I give something to this gentleman right here, and I go, oh, I'm going to revoke your right to use it, give it back. Well, what if... Um, I gave him something, but it was his to begin with. And I say, well, I'm going to revoke your right to travel. You don't have a driver's license. And he says, hey, I gave you the right to revoke, so I'm going to revoke your right to revoke my revoke. <laughs> Are you seeing what I'm saying? We have the right to travel. We have the right to our personal effects. We have the right, and I like this word, we have the right to travel unfettered. Now, that's almost... R-rated right there, unfettered. <laughs> if anybody ever looks up that word, it's a great word, unfettered. Harassed? That's right. It's, a, it's even worse than harassed. Um, it's to be held. Okay. How can, they, how can they pay you, if they've held you against your will, how can they pay you back for the time you lost? They can't. Ten minutes is gone. You can't pay me back that. So, revocation. Revocation of power of attorney. Now, there's a nice sling of words all together, isn't it? 
revocation of power of attorney. So let's go down the chain of events. Your parents got married. They gave up their right to all they are going to accumulate in the wording of the license of marriage. They gave it to the state. Remember how the state sounds a lot like estate? Okay. So now that they've given up all their rights to all their property, their children, anything that they accrue under that marriage, they've agreed to give up to the state. Now, when mom goes down and has the baby at the hospital, they won't let usually the dad sign the birth certificate because... There would be two signatures on there. It would be twice as hard for them to prove this all in all later. But mom turns into a informant, and she gives up right and title to the child. That's why they take that birth certificate and send it off. The live birth lets them know there's a new estate being put into the system. So that goes to, this is crazy. It goes to the Treasury through the DTCC, and that is turned into a security, and income or outgo goes into the system on your behalf. So now mom has just given up title to the child, and by giving up title, she gave power of attorney to the state to handle all your affairs. Excuse me, the child's affairs. I don't want to insult anyone. Now, if you don't revoke that power of attorney if I give him over here the power of attorney in my affairs and I go to court and I start yelling and screaming and he just sits there and the judge says uh, where's the power where's, where, where's the, uh, the man who has power of attorney and let's say the prosecution stands up and goes we agree to go to jail and to pay a fine of $15,000 and uh, pay back the estate uh, for this gentleman, how can I argue with that? I gave him power of attorney. You see that? I can't argue with somebody that I gave power of attorney unless I revoke the power of attorney. Are you guys catching all this? Now, as we get older, we sign some other contracts. We give up power of attorney to our right to travel, to the officer, to the court, to the judge, to the clerk of the court. We give up power of attorney there. When we get old enough to have uh, maybe a job, when I was when I was younger, it was when you started working, 12, 13 years old, you went and got a social security number. So you gave up power of attorney to your estate's income and turn everything that you make into a taxable event. I like that. That's what I was looking for. A taxable event. So realistically, everything that we spend to any government agency is a tax. And we have given up power of attorney to argue any points. These guys that go into court and argue about tax law 28 and section code 15 and USC, all of it. It doesn't matter. You don't, you're not there as an attorney. You have to hire an attorney because you gave up power of attorney. So when we learn how to start revoking their authority that we gave them, because they can only have something that was given to them. Remember that. You cannot cre create something bigger than yourself. So if they have the power or the authority to throw someone in jail, we have the power and authority to throw someone in jail. And if we gave them the power to do that, we can revoke that power. You guys following along with this okay? Mm -hmm. So revocation of power of attorney, revocation of a driver's license. Now, here's a cool part. Uh, the alphabet group will say DMV... IRS, CIA, some of those other alphabet groups. Whenever they act like they're in charge, they're only in charge by our either acquiescence or by our permission. So whenever they pass a law, act, slash, because there are no laws since 1933, remember that, there is no money. There are no laws. We're all acting under public policy. Whenever they pass a policy or an act, they have to give us remedy for the real man to get out of playing in the play. So there are lots and lots of forms that I've been find, finding on the Internet under the IRS subsection 
that give us the power to revoke almost everything that they're doing. Isn't that great? Awesome. So we don't have to argue anymore. We don't have to go in as a debtor. We can go in as a creditor. Now, if has anybody ever been in bankruptcy court? Just raise your hand real slow. But probably because people owe you money. <laughs> Is it better to go in as a debtor or as a creditor? Creditor. And what's the job of the trustee for the bankruptcy for the estate that's bankrupt? To find out who the creditors are. That way they get paid. That's the deal. They don't really care who the debtors are because the debtors are indebted to a debtor. So if you walked in and you had a sign on that said, <clears throat> debtor, right here on your chest, and the judge says, okay, we're going to find out who the creditors are so they can get paid, you could go, right here. <laughs> How about that? I'm, the de- I'm no longer the debtor, I'm the creditor. And uh, it looks like a corporation with two initials are the debtors, and I would like them to go ahead and pay me. And I'd like to use some of those alphabet guys over there to go collect it for me. Has anybody ever thought of that? There's a whole nother playing field. There's, a, there's an old um, theory that there could be two complete planets operating in unison right on top of each other parallel. that you couldn't see parallel right on top of each other because the molecular structure of wood is not the same as air and they can pass through each other. So what if we were operating in a matrix right now and as soon as you found out that you could pass out of where we're living right now and start flying in a whole other dimension, wouldn't you be interested in doing that? Yeah. And my answer is yes. This is great. Um, I had an experience the other day. I went to a court and um, fi- went in to file some paperwork. <laughs> is this, is, this is some funny stuff. I had been sent a notice saying that somebody was suing me. It was a credit card company. And um, they were looking for some money. Now, I know there ain't no money, so I was willing to settle with them. However, they didn't have the feeling that I had about money, and so they filed the small claims against me. Now, this is all great. No big deal. So I beat him in this one court. Because I beat him, the judgment went for three times the amount plus punitive damages. So instead of them getting $2,000, I'm owed $76,000. But the court says, well, it's in small claims, so we got to get it out of here. And besides, we know Bill, and we don't want that in our court. So they sent it off to the Superior Court. So I get a notice from the Superior Court, if you want to continue with this case, you need to come down here and pay $168. Extortion, excuse me, fraud, excuse me, uh, a fee. (laughs) For educational purposes only. Thank you for that. So I go down there and I stand in line behind a whole bunch of slaves. I didn't see the king's line anywhere. I asked for it. I said, hey, do I have to wait in this line? I'm not one of them. They said, yeah, just for a minute. And I said, okay, I'll respect the time of my brothers. So when I got to the counter, I said, hey, I got this notice, and um, it's, it's, it's bothering me. <laughs> she goes, why is it bothering you? And I said, because I'm the respondent. And according to the rules of procedure, respondent doesn't have to pay to prove his innocence. Now, whoever brought, this is what I told her, whoever brought the controversy also must bring the remedy. That's law. That's law's a maxim. So I said, so I want you to go ahead and open up a file on this for me. So she reads it and she goes, oh no, I can't do that. You have to pay $168. I said, well, if it says there that I get a million dollars if I win, do it. Because I can write that in right now. I'll just write it on there. She goes, no, 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 no. What I meant was, if, if you want to pr- <laughs> pursue this, you have to pay $168. And I said, well, I really didn't want to do this. But if you're not going to go ahead and charge the credit card company, then I authorize you to access the replevin bond that they filed when they filed this suit against me. She goes, uh, I need to get my supervisor. I don't agree. Say that one more time. You need to do what? I told them that they needed to take the money out of the replevin bond that the credit card company was required to file when they filed suit against me. 
a replevin bond is an insurance policy just in case they made a mistake, like they sued a real man instead of the straw man, and they didn't spell it right, and maybe they thought there was real money, and I was supposed to pay back with real money, and all these other things like the gold standard in HDR 192 and public law 7310. I mean, they were really messed up, okay? They made a huge mistake when they messed with the real man. And I don't want to get too excited about this. But anyway, so the lady comes back and she goes, um, I, uh, our supervisor's out to lunch. I go, 3 o'clock, are you kidding me? So I said, okay, well, here, I want you to give her this note, and I want you to give it to her in private. So I, I, I accepted their offer, and I returned it with my signature and a stamp and a thumbprint on it, if you guys know what I'm talking about. And she goes... She looks at it, and I said, I will go ahead and affect payment this one time on this case, but I expect reimbursement for this. Do you understand that? And she looks at it, and she goes, oh, that's good. So she puts it in the file, and she takes off, and she goes, I'll have uh, Maureen Green call you when she comes in. I said, great. So I don't get a phone call. Nothing. A couple of weeks later, I get a pile of paperwork from the attorney's office. And because they were out of date, 90 days past the due date, when they were supposed to respond, now I've got them in default. And so I said, well, now that they've opened up the deal, I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and file this. So I went back to the clerk of the court, and I said, hey, I need to file this into the case. This is an order for the judge to sign, because they're in default, and according to rules and procedures, they lost. So I need you to... She goes, well, there's no file number. I go, oh, Really? I came in here and paid for it. Oh, did you pay the 168 or whatever it was? I accepted their bill and told them where to go get it. The estate is responsible for paying that, right? Okay. For educational purposes only. So she says, uh, oh, she's looking at the screen and she goes, no, I don't have any. And then you could see her. She goes, ah, there's nothing in here. I'm, oh. Are you Bill? How about that? Have you seen me on the videos? What? I said, no, uh, I am Bill, and um, there was supposed to be a file opened. I affected payment here uh, several weeks ago, and I still haven't gotten notice. And she goes, I need to get my supervisor. I'll be right back. So the next lady comes up, and she says, she has a pile of paperwork, and she goes, hi, are you Bill? I said, I'm the authorized representative, probably for the one that you're referring to. Do you need to speak with me? She goes, I would like to in private. I said, great. How about that? I'm in the private side already. Bang! So I walk over into this private room and she says, um, we need $168 to open this file. And I said, I already paid it. And so I said, let me see that. So I just reach over and I take the file from her and she hands it to me. Isn't that cool? When you're the king, you just ask for things to happen and they happen. I take the page and I flip it over and I go, how about that? There's an A for V right there on the front. See, I paid for that. You have, you have notice right here. I paid for it. Now, what's the problem? She goes, well, we don't recognize that. I said, that's because you haven't opened up a file. If you opened up a file and took that to the judge, the judge would recognize it, and everybody would be really happy right now, including me. And I'm not happy. You didn't take this. I said, so here's the case. Here's the order that I'm sending in, and this is the file, and you need to take this and have the judge sign this. So open up a file and do that for me. So she takes it from me, and she goes, well, I'll have to find out about that. Thank you. I said, great. Now, when she took that, what did she do? Accepted for value. Oh, she accepted my offer. I love that part. <laughs> I really do. So I get a phone call a couple days later, three, four, five, six. Oh, past the three days. It looked like it was a week. They had 72 hours, right? 72 hours to reject my offer or to give me reason why they couldn't accept it because of the Fair Lending and Trading Act. So she says, um, I need to talk to you. We still need $168 to open this case. And I said, we got real problems now. Now, I said, I'll be in to talk to you in a little bit. Now, there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on. The first case that was filed, there's a Replevin bond. That's in a little town called... And... <laughs> now that judge up there didn't want to hear the deal and as soon as it got out of his jurisdiction because it went over $10,000 they sent it to another place called <laughs> now if they forgot to send the replevin bond with it there's a violation of an oath taken up there because in commerce they have to send the money 
with the controversy. Right? So, somewhere the replevin bond's gone. So, when I get home on Monday, I get to go over to my favorite court and say, Hey, brother, I need to talk to the guy that's administrating this corporation here and talk to him about the replevin bond that didn't make it to fight. <laughs> because they don't have any record of it. For educational purposes only. When somebody files a lawsuit, they have to put in there a bid bond, which means if you don't show up, that's the amount of the lawsuit. So the payment is already, in effect, paid. Now, some lawyers have bar numbers that are also double as an insurance policy. Now, when you show up and respond to a offer, they have to post another bond. It's called a performance bond. The performance bond is three times the amount of the original bid bond. Just in case they damage you, you walk away with the gusto. Now, has anybody ever been convicted of a crime, excuse me, sentenced, excuse me, brought before a judge to stand trial and won? Has anybody ever done that? Okay. Whatever the amount of your case was, there was three times the amount put into a bond. So when you won, did you go back there and say, hey, I need my money? Honey? They don't tell us that. So when you leave it there, they get to collect it because you abandoned that money. They're crooks. They're not crooks. You just didn't find out the rules yet. I'm just telling you a few of the rules for entertainment purposes only. Okay, so now there's this this whole deal with replevin. Replevin means to reinsure. Okay. Now, this whole system is in place for us, guys. All we have to do is learn how to operate in it. Now, when I gave that lady my documents, it says in Admiralty. That is a port. Now, there's another port called Statutory. There's another port called Common Law. There's several ports that you can place documents in a court. But when you hand some documents to the clerk of the court, they have a responsibility to deliver those to the right port. Because if they don't, they violated a thing called trust. Not only trust, but it's the Bill of Lading Act. If you guys want some really interesting stuff, read the Bill of Lading Act and start thinking about the shipper as a clerk of the court and the port as admiralty or common law. Now, I love admiralty. Admiralty is really good for me because that has to do with contract. So let me give you a couple of things that make a contract valid. Two signatures signed with wet ink by two living people. The second thing is both of those people had to be of majority age, over 18. The third thing is, is all the things in that contract have to be disclosed. The fourth thing is, is that there has to be a mutual benefit for both sides. It can't be one-sided. And five, I'm going to have to think about that one. Offer and acceptance. It has to be accepted. Offer and acceptance. So, once we have all that into place, how many people have seen their credit card transactions with two signatures on them? <coughs> okay. How about the application? <coughs> okay. How about <laughs> your driver's license? <coughs> how about Social Security? <coughs> okay. Well, that just about covers the two signatures. So now we're operating under, objectively, uh, an adhesion contract that's only enforceable when you agree to it. Is everybody okay with all this? We, we, we can win on every issue. I love Admiralty. When you bring my vessel into port, man, I've got cannons now. And I'm looking over there at their BB guns, and it's not good. Now, if I revoke their power of attorney to speak on my behalf, who can speak in court when I'm there? Nobody. Nobody, because I'm the only real man there. See, they're all actors. Everybody's dead there. They're all corporations acting on behalf of a corporation. So anyway, I'm going to wrap it up here tonight to tell you that being an executor is really a cool thing. But there's a lot of responsibility, especially if you want to be the settler in that 
that trust. So, don't take this lightly, but remember that you cannot lose if you're well prepared. Is everybody excited? Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for coming out tonight. We appreciate you all. Yeah. Well, Winston Shroud speaks on it pretty good. I like Winston Shroud's videos. Uh, you can pull up Winston Shroud on Google and search for a lot of his videos that are on there, and you can you can watch those. But um, there's a, a book called Gilbert uh, Trust Law Study. That's a book, Gilbert. Um, I've got some stuff from 1893 on trust law that I pulled up off the internet. That's in PDF form, so you can you can download that. Find that that way, yeah. And any, any books that are written from the 1900s and older, realistically, are really good stuff to read, especially if you know who the actors are when you when you come into court. Google Books is a good place Yeah, that's it. Gilbert Law Summaries. What? Gilbert Law Summaries. Study. Study. Yeah. Oh, Gilbert Law Summaries. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. What he said is um, if you're looking up words in court, a lot of times the, the definitions of words change over the years, and what we think they mean today are totally different than what they were when they were written. Some of the words in the Constitution don't mean today what they meant back then, so you need a Black's Law Dictionary. I have all, all uh, eight editions, so I have Black's Law 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then there's a dictionary that was around during the Constitution and during the second Constitution called Bouvier's. And that's a really good one, too, because the words from Bouvier's to the eighth edition of Blacks are almost completely different. So you need to go in there and make your own definitions. Nine. There's a ninth one now. Okay, another question. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so have you just revoked your own driver's license and you've gotten up? What I've done, and this is just how I did it, I kept my driver's license, but um, I'm, I'm just holding it for my estate. Now, I've got uh, I've got people that ride around with me in my truck that aren't real comfortable with confrontation, <laughs> and I love her. <laughs> so what I do is I, I operate in the matrix. Um, I, I have a driver's license, and a lot of times I, I, I've i never showed it. I can tell you this, in the last uh, five or six years, I've, I've never showed the driver's license. I can usually handle that in a real calm manner and get out and talk to the guy and leave without any confrontation and no citations. From time to time, I do get pulled over, and it's almost better not to have one because they write you up for not having a driver's license in possession. Now, that's really good when you get to court because you say to the judge, hey, I told him there was no contract in place. He asked me for it. I didn't have one. And so there's no contract and there's no proper notice. So what are we here for? That's a nice thing to start off the conversation with the judge. <laughs> now, i got to tell you that judges are really ramping up for sovereign people. And sovereign people, uh, um, we're not being recorded, are we? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, the word sovereign, it, it can be very um, detrimental to you on the side of the road. So I don't like using that word. Um, there's a lot of videos. If you pull up the word sovereign on the on the Internet, there's a lot of videos where they've... Uh, they're giving them to law enforcement officers, how to watch out for you, be careful for guns, ammunition, and that stuff. In fact, I quit carrying a gun uh, six, eight months ago because I don't want there to be an accidental planting of one. So everybody that knows me knows I'm not carrying anymore. But we don't want any confrontation there. When someone starts yelling, I'm a sovereign, and I don't have to do this, and I don't have to do that, what they're really saying and what the officer's hearing is, I'm a slave, I live on the plantation, and I don't want to be, but I don't have the guts to get out and do what it takes so that I can operate in commerce without any controversy. So I don't like using the word sovereign. But if you get out and you tell them that you don't have a driver's license, and you can, you know how to defend that when you get to court, that's really a great thing. Does that answer your question? I think so. <laughs> so I, I do have one, but I don't I don't show it. I need it for opening up 
bank accounts and I need it for maybe checking out books at the library to get a card. My, my uh, straw man, I shouldn't say mine, the straw man that's operating as an entity, he needs it. He needs to open up bank accounts and he needs to say maybe pick up his mail at the office uh, when he forgets his, uh, his mail key. So, I mean, there's things that it's good for, but um, I don't like to use that for contract purposes. Okay? How, how does that keep you? I mean, doesn't that put you in dishonor with the officer that you've got one and you say you don't? Who has one? Well, last time I looked at the straw man, he's got a condo. It's a P.O. box. It's about this big. It's really nice. That's where he lives. That's the port in which the U.S. corporation goes through. And what they're hoping is that the trustee shows up to pick up his mail. For about a year now, the trustee has not picked up his mail. The beneficiary and the executor has been picking up his mail. Come on, man. Smile. I'm listening. Okay. So, I don't have a driver's license. The estate does. So, when the officer pulls a car over that I happen to be traveling in, and he asks for a driver's license, I have to tell him, the guy that has a driver's license is dead. (laughs) Now, I'm driving him around right now. But I don't need one to travel, so are you following me? Mm-hmm. Okay. You actually see that to an officer? Oh, yeah. My wife, if, you, if you can get my wife to sit down and talk with you for five minutes, she can tell you some stories. <laughs> okay. Any other questions before we go? Does she laugh when she... When she when oh, yeah. She says, oh, yeah. She's just laughing. She's... If anybody knows my wife, she's very serious. One of the things that they said, I was reading something along the same lines you're talking about, where they're training up the police. And if you come up with this sovereign, they're automatically going to be trying to put handcuffs. Red alert. That's right. That's right. So one of the lawyers I was talking with, a lawyer that's into this rather than... Anyway, says, you're we the people. Right. He said what? I'm one of the people. He said he's one of the people instead of saying he's a sovereign. There's, I'm one of the people. There, there are so many great remedies. There are so many ways to handle it that you have to figure out something that works. And when it works for you, don't change it. Okay? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to answer questions when you get pulled over. If, uh, if you were traveling at 100 mile an hour in a 55, you should be concerned about the well-being of the other sovereign people around you and probably maybe not do that. If um, you're traveling with your seatbelt pulled down underneath your arm and you get pulled over, you might want to um, accept his offer and return it right away. (laughs) There's a lot of things that you can do to remedy a problem. Now, remember, since 1933, all crimes are commercial. Commercial means it has to do with money. And the next sentence, in 1933, they tell us that they're is no money. There's only credit. Go ahead. What about car insurance? I pay for car insurance. I do. I can't get any windshield companies to A for V at windshields yet. <laughs> and I get, a, I get a rock in my window. It seems like every four or five months I get a nice new bullet hole right there in the front. So I, I carry insurance. I think it's a great thing to have. Um, if you can afford it, that's great. If you can't afford it, then there's some other remedies. You know, I mean, you, you might ask your estate to pay for that because that's one of the things the executors do. They make sure that um, after uh, the testator dies, uh, the grass in the front yard of this place needs to be watered, and the house needs to be kept up real well because you never know. You might want to. He might need to sell it to pay for something. So you want to make sure that all of his property is up kept. Okay. So that might be insurance for them, whatever you think. Okay. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? One more. Okay, way back there in the back. The question is, uh, can you explain briefly about signing uh, an offer? We call them offers or contracts. Um, the 14th Amendment uh, citizens or the U.S. citizens in the slave camp, they like to call them tickets. 
<laughs> okay. Before I get into that uh, question right there, because I don't want to, I don't want to get out of the, uh, I don't want to get out of the box. But when you get to court, the judge places an order, right? He tells you, okay, I order you to do this, right, or I order you to do that. Is that correct? Yeah. When you go to McDonald's and you place an order, who has to pay for the order? You. Okay. So the next time the judge places an order, you pay for it. Tell him to pay for it. Okay, so when you get pulled over by an officer, <laughs> there's um, a couple of things that um, really wreak havoc back at the corporation that that ticket's going to be sent to, where the administrator that wears a dress will see it. <laughs> Nobody's laughing. <laughs> okay. If you put a box around your name, if you understand the four corners rule, if uh, you see a document that has square brackets around it, Carla, I wish you would bring, uh, did you bring your thing? Maybe go look at Carla's, uh, too bad. She got a notice from an attorney or a real estate agent or somebody, and it, it was saying that uh, the bank name in boxes is uh, requiring you to move out of your house and that uh, they have title in boxes to the place and that there's uh, conflict, right? Well, everything that was in boxes was not on the contract, so you could take a pen and write through it so it's not there and then read the contract. And if it makes sense, you still got a contract. If it doesn't make any sense, then the whole contract is void. Mm -hmm. So anything in a box is not on the contract. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you so, actually draw a line through it? What, 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 uh, if you make a box around the signature area and then sign inside the box, mm -hmm. if an officer has ever been to court where they've thrown the ticket out, he'll be really upset that you do that. But if he's not quite up to speed on things, that's one way to handle an offer. The other way is to sign it as an authorized representative. Now, that's the way I like to do things for informational and educational and entertainment purposes. <laughs> and if you look in uh, UCC 401, I believe it is, it says that any signature that is unambiguous has been unambiguously signed. Now, if you look up un unambiguous, it comes from the word ambiguous, which means to hide or be deceptive or deceitful. So if it's unambiguously signed, authorized representative, and then you sign your name, it says in the UCC code that that signer is not responsible for anything on the contract. So if you sign it that way and you don't show up in court, they may give you some lenience because you signed it as a authorized representative for a dead guy, say. But before you do that, make sure you understand how you're going to defend all that. Okay, you may want to show up as a real guy and, and let him know by way of the death certificate, excuse me, the birth certificate. Are you guys following me? Yeah. I had a judge one time say, well, if William isn't here today, then I'll just issue a warrant for his arrest. And I said, well, let me go ahead and give you the defendant now. Can I visit him? <laughs> and he goes like this to the to the bailiff. Is that his uh, birth certificate? And the bailiff goes, yes, it is. Yes. Give it back to him. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Let me get this guy here. He's, he hasn't had a chance yet. Explain the difference between a birth certificate and a certificate of live birth. Yeah, the certificate of live birth is what they they fill out for you at the hospital for the woman who is now the informant that's abandoning the child. That's the that's a live birth. That gets sent off to a warehouse receipt company. That's good, and they put that onto a stock certificate. They turn it into a security, and then they monetize it. So that's a certificate. Anything that's a certificate means that you gave up title to. So if you have a certificate, uh, let's say a certificate of title on a car, that's not the title. The title's gone. They lost it. Certificate of title means somebody else owns it. They're just giving you something to verify to you that they own your stuff. Got it? 
the only thing that's that's true title is a manufacturer statement of origin. Mm. What is that for in the birth? Certificate of live birth. Or certificate? No, certificate of live birth. What's certificate of live birth? Well, I would say a manufacturer statement of origin would probably predate a certificate of live birth too. If you know what I'm saying. Go ahead. It's called an affidavit of conception. An affidavit of conception is a great thing. Um, <laughs> manufacturer statement of origin is a little better for me because I'm kind of a hands-on, you know, mechanic kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. What's it called? Birth certification. What, do you yeah. what does it mean? Birth certificate. It's a lot smaller, and it doesn't it doesn't it's not really attached to a security. So, but um, I, does anybody need a certificate to prove that I was born? No, no. I mean, I'm here. No, I Hello. Hello. Okay, so where were you born? Around here somewhere. I was born on the earth. God's planet. Hello. God's planet. All right. Too young to remember. Hey, yeah, that's another thing. That's a great one. Uh, when they ask you what your birth date was, can anybody absolutely tell what day they were born? No. Without a shadow of a doubt. It's all hearsay, isn't it? Your parents told you, your, your teacher told you. I told that to the judge. I don't know. I was awful young when I was born. I can't remember a lot of stuff back then. And if I told you what my parents told me, that would be hearsay, and that's inadmissible as evidence in this court of law. How about that? Okay. So you guys, are you done? Have we had enough? All right.